Okay, that's passing here. Damn shit! 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 God's mind through obedience, devotion, and bravo. Down the line, promises of prayer are untenable. Street whore. I do want to read those first three words again. Prayer doesn't work. Street whore? Not her, but, you know, she's cute, but... Uh, I, have I have this long-running long -running discussion on her right saying now, street and no, she's just she's cute. what it really is, is self-talk. You can touch your head. Boop! She's adorable. Let me send her a friend request. She's cute. She's all-powerful. She's all-powerful. She can answer all your questions, do all your stuff. You have these kids. Like a lot of imaginary friends are more capable of the person that creates them. And I have to say that it doesn't work in the sense that Palmer says as well, well, a non-existing non God doesn't, doesn't answer, answer prayer at all. Now, now biblically, the idea, the idea of changing God's, God's mind is definitely, definitely there, and there are many exonerations to pray, pray. But, but mostly the problem theologically with prayer is that either God is A, going to do what he wants anyway, no matter what you pray, he's already preordained everything that's going to happen, or if he hasn't, then, then isn't, isn't it kind of, of okay, you arrogance want to, to say hey, God's going to change his mind? Come on, let's swap fours. If God's, 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 God's going to get what he wants to see in any way, why would you just skip the prayer or argue to his will and save a lot of time? time. She's uh, not. So theologically speaking, I always wrestled with prayer and I kind of got rid of it. Uh, because, because of what, he, of what, he, of what Palmer says. says. You know, you know, who am I to grovel before God? God? Who am I if God, God exists? exists? Who would I be to show any kind of devotion or obedience? obedience? What, what is that, that going to actually do, do if the, the divine, divine plan, plan is bigger than me anyway? anyway. And, and so, so there's, there's a lot, a lot of, of inconsistencies and inconsistent logic about, about prayer. So it doesn't I really see a dick in your future. The real nature of prayer from a from a religious establishment. I see a dick in your future. Keep people no. hoping in religion that it's connected to. It's about creating faith, 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 faith and exaggerating God dick. out of your side and it's going to do something for you. From a religious leader point of view, if things don't go as expected as expected in prayer, then the person I'm offering up for prayer is just not doing it right. It's one of those things when you look at how People respond to answer prayers is very interesting, interesting. Because, because it's never, never the product's fault. It's, it's always the fault of the person who uses it. it. So, so if, if, if you pray, pray and don't get what you want, you did it wrong, you did it with the wrong motivation, you didn't write hard, hard about, about it, it. There's, there's always an excuse of why it didn't, didn't work, work, and that excuse is always focused on prayer, prayer the person, the person that's praying. And really, though, it's always about increasing the faith or Creating this, this mental, mental image, image, once again, of indoctrination. Come on! That allows a person to basically, <laughs> well, you know, that didn't happen, so it must be my fault. Okay, okay. So, so you're always blaming yourself for the failure of the supposed, supposed promises. promises. So, so, yeah, yeah it, 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 it kind of works that way for religious establishment. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, is prayer really an answer when the answers do come? Is it answered by God? No. Uh, uh, what usually happens, happens is one out of 20 prayers might actually be high. Uh, uh, I did my own journal one time, time writing every request I had during a, a prayer, prayer thing, thing, and then routinely going, going back through those prayer requests, prayer requests and seeing, seeing if they were answered. Were answered. I, think I think my rate, rate was like 1 in 25 got, got answered. answered. And, and when, when I started to realize that I wasn't getting a lot of answers to prayer, I wasn't even getting no or just wait answers. I was getting... Nothing. Nothing. And, most and most of those, of those prayers, prayers that were answered were prayers, prayers that could easily chalk up to circumstances, uh, like, like prayers for healing. healing. You know, I, went, I, went I went to the, to the doctor. doctor. Ah! I went to the doctor. So, so how did I know that it wasn't the medicine that fixed the problem? problem. I, didn't. I didn't. So I didn't even think about it. Well, it could, it could be, be the prayer, prayer or it could be that they got treatment. Okay, so... You know, you know, which, which one actually, actually helped them, them is, is a matter of question. question. The one, one thing, thing I never did have was, you know, like a visual of God, of God actually, you know, doing, doing work. work. You know, you I couldn't get a picture or video of God actually answering prayer. prayer. Couldn't get any empirical, empirical evidence that God actually did anything at all. Uh, and so, so I was really, really taking prayer on faith, whether I was a believer. And there's other research in prayer that I've read over the years, you know, that's problematic. People pray for when they're about to get treatment in a hospital. For medical, medical procedures, if, if a person, person is knowingly being prayed for, they know it, they, they do, do worse than somebody who doesn't know if anybody's praying for them at all. 
it's almost, it's almost like, like a performance, performance sort of performance, performance anxiety, anxiety I guess, that, that results, results in a negative, negative result, result that the that person, person doesn't, doesn't want to let everybody, everybody down and God, God down, so they actually get themselves into an anxious state, state which actually is negative when you're going through a procedure, you really need to relax and you know, let your body heal, and you know, when you know it, you understand it, so he's praying, you get a little tense, and does it, oh, it's better work, you know, that kind of thing, and it ends up backfiring, so... Uh, you know, there's the nothing that fails that, that prayer. Calm down there prayer fails a lot. And, and, but the tool of it is more of an indoctrination tool. It's more about keeping people faithful to the idea that somehow God is going to come through them. So why doesn't the establishment want to know that you need to know this? Because if prayer is exposed as fraudulent, then the whole gig is up. It is the essence of everything a personal relationship with God is about. Okay, when you look at prayer in the context of, say, Christianity, you pray to enter into this relationship, you pray to continue this relationship. Worship is basically prayer of the community to God. The community gathers to pray. There is so much hinging in many religions that prayer is a central element to it, and if you realize that prayer doesn't really do anything, then the whole gig of religion, the, the whole mechanism, that really keeps people faithful is up. You know, if religious leaders can keep you praying and hoping for answers from God, then they never get scrutinized as to whether or not what they're doing is actually helpful. It never occurs to you people that are praying and really devoted to it that the whole thing might be a fraud. Getting a person to be religiously devoted is a way of keeping them in the fold. And that's why the religious establishment doesn't want you to really look at prayer and decide whether or not it actually really works in the practical real world. Deconverting from religion, especially if you become an atheist, means that the prayer is only possible. The only real good thing I could ever come out of prayer was uh, this form of self-talk. But you basically self-talk the idea of the supreme person that you're talking to and realize you're talking to yourself. Then you can actually discard it altogether if you really want to. I've said before that some, for some people, constructive self-talk is very beneficial for them. But you have to get rid of the delusion that you're talking to a supreme being and instead realize you're talking to yourself for that to be true. Otherwise, many people can discard it altogether and actually start doing something about the situations instead. You know, if you're having problems with your spouse, instead of praying about it, perhaps you should seek out good counseling and work on your communication skills or whatever the issue is and actually try to solve it together. Uh, if you're short on money, maybe you're re-examining your career and maybe looking at education options, changing jobs, or whatever, might be a better option rather than praying and hoping God just drops a million dollar check in your, in your uh, mailbox. If you're having serious mental issues, getting therapy to help with it, getting the medical care that you need when you're in a situation where you need healing. In other words, what you can do is prayer all of the situations. It's an unnecessary step. The thing is, the believers just add this step to the mix, and really what they're doing is delaying, wasting time, or in some cases, have, I've actually seen it in the Pentecostal church that I used to grow up in. Well, I'm not going to go to the doctor now, I've been prayed for. Yeah, that usually ends up being a mistake, okay? And that's the problem with it. Prayer allows you to think now, that you're doing something right and you're really here. not doing anything at all. And it's kind of what's annoying to me now when I see people, oh, I'm facing this situation. Oh, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Thoughts of, you haven't done anything for them. Not, it causes you to go through this loop where if I just pray for them, then I've done something for them, but I haven't actually fixed their situation at all. Whereas if I had the means to fix their situation, you know, like, oh, man, my, my, my friend has been in this car accident, and what they really could use is, you know, like, you know, a good recommendation where to go for after treatment or other injuries, or maybe somehow getting the car fixed up and up and running, you know, they have insurance, but it doesn't cover everything. You know, I, you know, I, I really have a lot more money than I really need, so I could help them out, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to pray for them because that's almost as good. And it really allows you, there's a, I hate to say it, but there's a dehumanizing element to prayer in the sense that you can say, I'm going to pray for somebody so actually engage in human empathy and say, well, I'll just give it to God to show empathy for them instead of 
you know, doing it myself. Um, and that's kind of one of my biggest problems with prayer and the whole now, thoughts and prayers thing. That poem okay, why don't you do more than thoughts and prayers and actually do something to help them? And one other interesting aspect of deconversion is the grief that Man, comes from losing sucks. your imaginary friend. This is boring. It's a... This kind of becomes weird. If you're a long-time believer like I was, and you did pray fairly regularly like I did, then all of a sudden not having a God to pray to is a very lonely experience for a while. And Shut the sh fuck up, bitch. You are boring as shit today. <laughs> you slut that stop from China! God damn it. God damn it. Man, this is bullshit. How do I get rid of one of these fucking knights? Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. 
Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon. In today's episode 46 of my Secular Bible Study Series, in which we are looking at 1 Corinthians. This is the fourth letter written by Paul, you're going chronologically, so it comes before Romans. And by the way, I know that the Gospels are super interesting, and then you get the crazy adventure book of Acts, then you get the theological magnum opus of Romans, you have Revelation, but everything in between can kind of feel redundant or boring, and I'd like to encourage you to not think that way. Each book, and especially each letter of Paul, is fascinating, I think, for understanding modern Christianity and also for understanding where Christianity came from, the excuses and apologetics that were being made right away to defend these things. And this one does not disappoint, so stick with me today. I think you'll find this very interesting. Let me go ahead and set the stage, and then we're going to dive into a point one book overview. But there's a few things I think it's cool to see all the pieces coming together. You know, in Acts 18, we can see Paul as he meets Aquila and Priscilla, and he gets to Corinth. He has plans to go to Ephesus, which is his third missionary journey. And that's where Paul is right now as he writes the first letter back to Corinth, or the Corinthians. And this letter is a correction. Now, what's cool is unlike 1st and 2nd Kings or 1st and 2nd Chronicles, which were just broken up for their length, these letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, are broken up because they are indeed separate letters. The second letter back to the Corinthians that we'll get to next week is Paul defending himself. Because after the Corinthians get this letter, they're like, who are you to say so anyways? And so you're going to see a very defensive Paul next week, where here we get a very corrective Paul. According to Acts 18, Paul founds the church in Corinth somewhere around 50 to 51 CE. And then between 52 and 55, he's on his third missionary journey. He's hanging out in Ephesus, and he writes this first letter. Then we get something after the letter. It's a very brief visit of Paul to Corinth to kind of address the letter. This is usually referred to as Paul's painful visit. Then Paul writes a new letter that we have called the severe letter, and this is something that is lost to time. We know about it, but we don't have it. And then as Paul is traveling through Macedonia, we hear reports about what's going on, and he decides to write his second letter to the Corinthians. So that's it. Now, where and what is Corinth? Corinth was very strategically placed to connect the Peloponnesian Peninsula to mainland Greece. So this connects the Ionian Seas. This is a major trade hub. Also, fun fact, it's got the second most important games, the Ismithian Games, only second to the Olympic Games themselves. Corinth started as a Greek state. It was destroyed and conquered by the Romans in 146 BCE, and then it is rebuilt about 100 years later as a Roman colony in the the year 44 BCE and immediately came back to be very prosperous. So with all that popularity with the ah! and all the trade and the importance and all of the wealth, this brings a lot of different cultures. And now you have this newly established church by Paul with all of these Greco-Roman influences and this, this is where things start God, to go wrong. Thus, Paul's first letter, which we're going to break down in a few segments. And the first one is going to take us from chapters 1 through chapters 4. Now, a lot happens here. We have Paul's introduction and greeting and thanksgiving. This is pretty common for Paul. And then he gets right into the divisions of of the church. Now, this is so interesting. It's literally what happens today. It even is what happens on YouTube with a certain apologist that people like or a certain pastor that people like to follow. And I'll just read to you so you can kind of hear it in Paul's words. It sounds so very modern. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So again, yeah, you have kind of these cliques developing in Corinth. Well, we like Paul. Paul taught us this. Well, Paul said this. Well, Cephas said this. Well, what about when Jesus said this? They're already seeing the disunity. There's already different leaders within the communities that have different ideas that are more attractive or less attractive to certain people in certain groups. And so you have this division, you have this infighting, you have denominations. In this section, Paul brings it back in chapter 2. This is about Christ crucified. This is all that matters. Let that be the guiding factor, which is, again, pretty and 
as far as the Christian belief goes, would be a true statement, but not helpful to the individual differences and the mutually exclusive claims and contradictions that everyone's trying to deal with. And by the way, Apollos is another leader at this time, kind of a wannabe Paul, and, and Paul even says this, he says, what I planted, Apollos watered, which is a good way of understanding that, you know, Paul is a missionary. He goes, he builds plants. I mean, all of the terminology that Paul uses is what we still use today in modern Christianity. It really is just amazing how foundational this was. But then he goes and he moves on and other leaders will rise up. The problem is, is sometimes, again, they get more popularity than Paul or a different idea than Paul. What they're watering, what they're shepherding might look different or might just be more attractive. And so Paul in chapter 3 is talking about the division between him and Apollos and any other leader and, again, trying to get back on track with unity. And he goes on in chapter 4 to make the point they're all, any apostle, any leader is just a servant of Christ, not worth forming a clique over. We are simply at the disposal of Christ, trying to bring about the one true church. The last verse of chapter four always gets me and says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and the spirit of gentleness? And I think that sums up Paul well, because you can almost see that inner turmoil in him as he writes these letters. Many of them are in the spirit, or he'll try to start in the spirit of rebuking and iron sharpening iron, that, you know, he's no better, but come on, guys, you know, let's let's do this, and let's unify in Christ. And other times it's, you're so wrong, you're so stupid, you're so foolish, why would you do this? Why can't you get this right? And it is just interesting to see, I don't know, these different approaches that he deems necessary based off different circumstances or different churches or different places, but it is, again, a character study of Paul, which be like the most fascinating thing in the world to me. But let's move into segment two for our book overview, which is going to be ethics issues. I say ethic issues because there's more than just sex, but most of what we're going to cover in chapters five through seven are about sexual immorality and marriage and things like this. But also in chapter six, we get some specifics on lawsuits for believers. Now, I'm going to come back to that in problematic passages, but I just want to cover what is covered here. And again, even like churches today, there is a lot of gossip going on. And so Paul has some very specific situations that he knows about of sexual misconduct. We have a man who had sex with his father's wife, and I want to just show how clearly this in-group, out-group thing is. You know, we have all these things about working with people and loving them where they're at and hitting the sin but not the sinner, but listen to what Paul says. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And again, hang tight, we're gonna to get to some of these examples in problematic passages because there's some pretty wild things said here, some pretty severe in-group, out-group think going on. So then we get to the lawsuits for believers, we get the avoidance of sexual immorality, we start getting into the principles for marriage, how often you're to give your spouse sex, not to withhold, and things like this. Things that have had catastrophic harm, even if you're just saying, oh, they're misusing it. Paul wrote it, and it ends with concerning ethics around the unmarried or widows and what that looks like. And it's funny because our next segment, segment three, is going to be mainly about food. And it's just like these things keep cropping up. Think about the Old Testament. Think about how many laws were around sex, and not even particularly sexual acts, but even women on their period or nocturnal emissions, these kinds of things, and how many were around food. To have such a focus that this idea of cleanliness and that sex is inherently unclean, that certain foods were inherently unclean, and that one needed to be clean, these came from the Levitical laws of what had to be followed to be in the presence of God. And it's like, even though Paul has left a lot of these Jewish ideas behind, and that's, by the way, a lot of what this book is struggling with is, but I thought we were free in Christ. Why is this still an issue? And sometimes Paul falls down hard on the side of, this is still an issue. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. How dare you? And sometimes it's, yeah, no, this was for them. This isn't for us. We're free in Christ. It's very inconsistent. And it's just, I think, interesting that with 613 laws to be worked from to understand God's heart, even if it's just for his chosen people, why when Paul extends this grace to a new group, the Gentiles, are they not subject to? Well, it, it really is right here that we start to pinch at why doesn't the Old Testament matter anymore? 
Why did those laws get broken? Why is there a new covenant? Where are you actually getting this from? And so much of it is from the apologetics and the philosophy of Paul. What I'm going to say here is the third segment around food, which is going to be chapters 8 through 10. And it starts off with food, but it just gets into Christian liberty. And the example that is used here is the food that the non-Christians were using to sacrifice. Should Christians be able to eat that or not? There was a lot of division around this. And here's Here's Paul's answer, and I'm summarized, of course. A, if it's going to be a reputation issue, if it's going to cause another person to fumble because they're confused about what you're doing, then don't do it. But if you're alone and no one can see you, this is just food. So enjoy it. This is the freedom that Christ brings you. But again, reputation is important. We don't want to confuse or cause others to stumble. So be diligent, be vigilant. So you could say, you know, about freedom and responsibility. But well, let's move on to segment four, which is going to be chapters 11 through 14. And I'm not sure what Fucker. words I knew I could win, track. spiritual sucker, gifts you or worship in general, sucker, what it looks like you, to act this sucker, out you together. You and that. and I'd I encourage everyone who thinks sucker, that you all got it right with this freedom and responsibility, responsibility that we just saw with one shit. issue, to read the beginning of chapter 11, where Paul is very specific about the right and wrongness of when women versus shit. men should wear head coverings. Bucker. Go and read it for yourself, and maybe I'll cover it in point seven. How stern, serious, and black and white this issue is to Paul. This isn't gray. This isn't freedom in Christ. This is a should do, Amen. a disgrace not to do, a command. Amen. So again, this is what I mean, the inconsistency with Paul on what he views as negotiable, and what he views as sternly as an Old Testament command. Then the rest of chapter 11 is Paul correcting on what the Lord's Supper is and is supposed to be and how to properly observe it. Then all of chapter 12 is this very long monologue on spiritual what they are, who can have them, when to utilize them, how they're different parts of the body of the whole and thus the church. And this is going to be, by the way, in direct conflict and contrast with other things that are said about spiritual gifts. So stick around for, again, point seven contradictions. Then we get to the famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Compare what Paul says love is here through direct revelation of with how God acts. And I did a video on that. So after this, go check that out if you haven't seen it. And then we get to the tongues chapter and prophecy. This is chapter 14. And also a little bit on worship at the end of 14. Contradictions everywhere here, by the way. Now we have two sections left, and each is just a chapter. Chapter 15 is all about the resurrection. Paul builds the case for how the resurrection can happen, which is where we get the claim of the 500 witnesses. This is something that so many Christians don't know. I know that a lot of us who are kind of in the community here know about it, and Paul just know about it because they have to defend it. But this isn't in the Gospels. This isn't anywhere else. This is one man, Paul, making one claim one time that, hey, by the way, we know this is true because 500 people saw it. And yet, how many pastors, preachers, and even apologists will say things like, look, we have over 500 people that saw Christ risen, and not one account from any of them, not one iota of evidence that they ever even existed. One claim from one man, Come on, unattested, unverified. That's it. That's your 500 witnesses. It's right here. And then he goes on to address the doubts, not even just the doubts of Christ's resurrection, but of resurrected bodies in general. What will happen to believers? And so he goes on and tries to explain this, and it's kind of wild, actually. Just listen to how Paul talks here. You know, so he gets down to the section on the resurrected body, and he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. This grand idea idea completely concocted in the mind of one man about what will happen to everyone after death. New planes of existence, places that physical bodies cannot be, a resurrected body in a new form, the mystery of it all. It's absolutely God, it as insane up. as any other religious claim from all the religions that Christians would say are evil, demonic, weird, pagan, etc. And we all just said, yep, 
That makes sense. Who cares what Jesus said? Who cares that it's mutually exclusive with what Jesus said? Or what the God of the Old Testament clearly said about the afterlife and where bodies go and these kinds of things. We'll just get over that. But am I still in point one? Okay, I apologize. Let's wrap this part up really quick. Segment six, chapter 16. We just get closing remarks, personal requests, greetings, and a collection plate being passed around for the believers in Jerusalem. So, again, normal church stuff. Let's move straight into point two authorship and date. We've covered a lot of this, so I'm going to move fast. This was probably written in 53 or 54 CE. This was his third missionary journey. He was in Ephesus when he wrote it. We know why he wrote it. We know to whom he wrote it. We know how he got it there. This is an authentic letter of Paul. There is really no question, even from the scholarly approach, that this is one of the forgeries. Not that someone couldn't say this if they were making a forgery, but again, just in terms of how we know it's Paul and not Titus or something like that. Paul starts and ends this letter, making sure that people know it was him in his own hand, which sometimes he used a scribe, like in Romans, that's totally fine. I think that's in Romans 16, where the scribe kind of says, hi, I'm writing this, and people get really confused by that. Totally fine, totally average for that day. But here, Paul specifically says it was by his hand. In terms of the manuscript tradition, this is going to be redundant to what we've seen. You've got your main two codexes that come out in the fourth CE, which have really clear full copies of 1 Corinthians, as well as Papyrus 46, which is in 200 CE, that also contains 1 Corinthians. The important part of that is to show the early transmission of Paul's letters, and Papyrus 46 comes from the larger Chester Beatty papyri. We have a good handful of textual variants. I'll give you a couple examples like I typically do. 1 Corinthians 13.3. Some manuscripts read, if I give away all I have, and some have to the poor added on. It's not a salvation issue, but it is a difference, and it does seem like at some point someone took a liberty, right, to make sure we knew who it should be given away to. Well, another one would be from 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and in some cases it's, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, and in others, we shall all sleep but we shall all be changed. The difference here reflects the interpretation of the resurrection. So, again, you could argue not that important in the grand scheme of what's being laid out in these chapters, but we do have textual variants, and there's more than just these two. And for this particular book, 1 Corinthians, most would be considered minor textual variants. So let's move right into point three, historical accuracy, background, context. I gave you a lot when we set the stage. We talked about Corinth and the rebuilding of Corinth by Rome and when that happened and the trading hub, the many different gods and ideas and philosophies and ideologies, these culture mesh is happening at the same place where Paul is trying to start another new religion. Pissed. I think one thing we can add here that is kind of cool is God to see Paul understanding the world around him for what analogies he's going to make. Like in 1 Corinthians 9, he has kind of this athletic metaphor. Knowing that Corinth hosts the Ismithian games, which Paul would have known, this would have made great sense to those people. I think that's really cool. So that would be an example of a cultural reference, and we're going to keep our eyes out for that as we see Paul in these different cities and talking to different groups. The archaeological evidence, you know, there's not a lot that we need to go off of here. I gave some examples of Rome, of, you know, the graffiti and the catacombs, and I think that's interesting. For Corinth, we have tons of archaeological evidence showing what a major hub it was. We have dug this stuff up. We have seen the Agora, the great marketplace, the theaters, the temples, the buildings. We know of the Temple of Apollo showing the great pagan worship of the day. We do have some verification from Romans 16, you Erastus suck. is mentioned, and we actually have Erastus you that has been found in the remains. We're going to reach outside of 1 Corinthians, but in Acts, which talks about some of this, you know, as Paul is dragged before the court officials, he may very well have been on the Bema seat. This is a judgment seat located in the forum where the public officials or even the Roman governors kind of addressed the people. So it is fun to be in the New Testament and be able to get these different understandings. We're not utilizing it, though, in the same way that we did back in, say, First Kings. Are there any archaeological dates <coughs> that have shown that 
the events described there, the battles, etc., could have actually happened. No, we trust, for the most part, Paul went where he said he went. God, a lot of these city names have even stayed the same. We don't really have reason to doubt it. God, it's more just cool it. to see the corroboration. Let's move on to point four, which we still have some new things to say for, and it will change a little bit, but in covering Romans, we've covered a lot of how Paul writes. So I'll just try to thread the details and cover any unique aspects from book to book, or epistle to epistle. In Romans, we saw the diatribe, a great rhetorical tool, and that is utilized here for sure. Also the exhortation, like in 1 Corinthians 13. But unlike Romans, we're now getting into Paul's epistles where it's a rebuke, where Romans was this Stupid! Corrective letters. Now, and go ahead and put my ass in check. Romans, Stop. you could almost say, though passionate, the tone is educational. Here, the tone is kind of this mix of compassionate ah. guidance, but also stern reprimand. Because say whatever you want about Paul and how harsh he is, he has an end goal of correct behavior, of unity, of spiritual blessing. He just doesn't mind getting there by any means necessary. Fear, love, carrot, stick, whatever is gonna work. Let's shape these people up or ship them out. So you can argue with his methodologies or the philosophy of how one should page. correct another, but he does have, to the Christian ideal, the correct desired outcome. We see an analogy that has been used before, expanded on here by Paul, and one is the body of Christ. We see this mainly in 1 Corinthians 12, and also in similar to the body of Christ, like in 1 Corinthians 3, we get the foundation, the building. Paul calls himself the master builder, laying the foundation, while others will come and build upon it. Like many writers, uh, and like much of the Bible, Paul likes to play with contrast, wisdom versus foolishness, strength versus weakness, versus division. He's pretty thorough in showing all sides and where people are currently at on the spectrum and where they need to be. And so his use of contrast is something worth noting. The love passage sticks out to me in ah! literary analysis. It's hymnal in nature. It's often considered a hymn. I got the, it's got, I got this myself poetic another structure war. nature to it that the rest of 1 Corinthians does not have. And then also unique here is 1 Corinthians 15, which is Paul repeating a creedal statement. And this is something we'll see often, just restating the gospel message, essentially. So we'll see a lot of this from Paul as we get into the rest of the epistles. But I think I, between but this his. more rebuking <gasps> oh! versus the more theological Romans, you're seeing some of the differences in how he chooses to utilize his writing to create different effects for different audiences. But let's move on to point five, which is main themes. I have just a few for you. The first one is unity. There's a reason the metaphor here in this book is that of the body. Many parts coming together to form one whole. This is how Paul sees the individuals to make up the church. And like a body, there's a different hierarchy of importance. The head, the heart, the hands, the feet, etc. So he plays off of that with church leadership and the roles for certain individuals and even within spiritual gifts, which we could make our second category, spiritual gifts. With everything that happens in 1 Corinthians 14 and where it crops up elsewhere in this book, we have to say spiritual gifts is a main theme of 1 Corinthians. Third would be love. Again, not just because of 1 Corinthians 13, but in Paul begging for unity, he often talks about love, the love of Christ that is in us, that Christ has given to us, how we should be given it to others as we unify. Fourth would be resurrection. I mean, man, 1 Corinthians 15 is very obvious. It's a huge part of this book. It really is the final chapter. You know, 16 is the final chapter, but it's all the greetings and the call for an offering. He ends the pinnacle here becomes 1 Corinthians 15 about resurrection. And then the last thing, just because of everything we get from like four to nine is going to be Christian ethics, which I think we've explained pretty well. So moving on to point six, reception and influence. The first place to see the impact of 1 Corinthians is on the early church fathers. We've talked about many of these who really like Paul. You've got Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, and Irenaeus have all quoted, we know they've quoted 1 Corinthians. In fact, it was Clement who about 40, 50 years later writes his 
own letter to the Corinthians where he references 1 Corinthians. And also the early Christian creeds that are going around, some of them are based very obviously off of 1 Corinthians 15. So the early church, the early church fathers, they had a lot of influence coming from this book. Of course, just church doctrines and practice in general concerning tongues, spiritual gifts, acts of worship, church unity, ethical behavior, like these are being set down foundationally. Even more so than the doctrines, you have certain theologies at play. In 1 Corinthians, we get Christ's nature He'd bring and that the whore. death on the cross and what his resurrection means. So Christology and Soterology. Some notable interpretations and adaptations, we've got Augustine of Hippo getting into Western Christian thought and ideologies on love and grace and resurrection. We have John Chrysostom, known for his very elegant sermons. His homilies on 1 Corinthians were amazingly influential for providing detailed exegesis and pastoral teaching. You know, Aquinas in his Summa Theologica utilizes 1 Corinthians extensively for his work on charity or love as a virtue. And within the Protestant Reformation, Luther is utilizing 1 Corinthians for the topics of faith and works and the sacrament. And all the way up to modern theology, something now, known as Liberation my, theology not right here. is really rooted in books like 1 Corinthians, emphasizing solidarity, community, justice, and equality. Of course, still very modern are ideas about sex and differences between men and women from a Christian perspective. 100% are pulled from 1 Corinthians in addition to others. The love chapter, you know, you look at wedding, <laughs> even within Christian unions, utilizing this book. So the, the reception influence, I mean, we could make entire... Stay! Stupid! Reception and influence that was for any stupid. particular New Testament book, especially Paul's epistles. But I think now it's time to move that on to point stupid. seven, which is going to be contradictions followed by problematic passages. And as always, let's go to the list. Again, please note, not all differences are contradictions, and I do point out differences here. You know, within book to book, Paul is pretty consistent, but there is one thing you could make an argument for. In 1 Corinthians 11, 5, Paul permits women to pray and prophesy in public, provided they cover their heads. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, Paul says that women should remain silent in church. Now, these aren't necessarily the same, but the reason I point this out is because Christians who want to make the case that the remain silent part is an addition will say, well, look, Paul obviously is okay with women praying and prophesying in public. It is possible there was a distinct difference to Paul between in public and within the church. Also, having your head covered, or even Paul says, maybe just cut the hair short, but since that isn't right to do, then definitely cover your head. There's implications there that I don't want to try to make a case for that you can get from the Old Testament about it causing lust to the angels up above, and that this would be the real issue. That's why cutting the hair short would also help, because it would not be as feminine. And if you think this kind of thing is crazy, again, you just haven't read your Old Testament, and if you think Paul isn't reading the Old Testament to get a lot of his ideas, it's not that far of a leap. But again, it would take a lot of explaining and something that's not worth doing here you for 1 Corinthians, but plenty of contradictions and differences when we compare 1 Corinthians to other works in the Bible. So let's get into those. I think the first thing I could point out is salvation Much! and baptism issues. I mentioned how Paul seems to not even care about the same things Jesus cares about. I'll give you an example. Matthew 28, 19. This is from Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter, who knew Jesus, unlike Paul, if we can believe Acts 2.38, says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here there's a link between salvation and baptism. You kind of took what Jesus said and went through ah! with it. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ did not send me to baptize. <laughs> what? But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and elegance, lest the cross of ah! be emptied of its power. This is what I mean. It's ah! like Paul has created his own complete identity and theology of a hierarchy of importance. Ah! He has just chosen to go so differently. And we know that Paul and Peter ah! conflict a lot. But again, if you were a Christian trying to figure out which ah! way to go, 
Would it not make more sense to go off Jesus's very words and Peter, who Jesus chooses to build his rock, right, the church right, upon? That's why it's so crazy to oh, that Paul's letters I was became so up those poems. much more the value system of the Christian doctrine building poems. than that of Jesus and his actual followers. The problem is they're all included in the canon. So even if you said, no, yeah, you're right, you can't just dismiss everything Paul is saying here. Otherwise, you have to say, we got it wrong. And because no one is willing to do that, everyone is utilizing all of this obviously contradicting behavior. Now, I won't take this much time on all of them, but this is how clear these differences are. Paul says something interesting about tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Tongues, then, are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. But in Acts 2, 4 through 6, you have the account of Pentecost, where speaking in tongues is obviously for the believers. In fact, it is a sign for believers that the Holy Spirit has come upon them. Now, I'm about to go into a contradiction between 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. Again, many, even Christian scholars, are on board that 1 Timothy is a forgery. So you can easily say, bring in no contradiction here. One was written by Paul, one was not. Well, we have many other books not written by Paul in the canon that we would still call out contradictions between. And the bigger issue here is, why are there forgeries in the Bible? And if Amen. Christians know about those forgeries, how can we trust other parts of the Bible? Amen. This isn't an argument from inerrancy, where the whole Bible has to be perfect or the whole thing's blown, which I think you can kind of make a case for. But when half the epistles of Paul are up for question, I think we really need to consider how we got the canon we have and why other books aren't included that have massive contradictions or why we've included the books we do have. And as soon as you say, oh, there's enough contradictions between them that we have to admit it's a forgery, then this just comes down to the picky and choosiness of what Christians are willing to call a contradiction. Issues everywhere. But I'm going to go ahead and state this. In 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9, we have Paul suggesting to yeah. remain unmarried if possible. It is better for the kingdom of God. But if you burn with lust, eh, go ahead and get married because sexual sin is so horrendous. Now, this is horrible advice in general. Many people are not ready for marriage. Many people need to date each other longer, mature more as an individual, etc. This we see still trickle down into very young Christians getting married because they can't keep their hands off each other, terrified of sexual sin, only to pop out a few kids and get divorced a few years later because they Suck weren't compatible. Butt. Now we have broken families with real harmful effects. I hate this verse. I think it is horrendous advice, all from a fear of sex. But contrast that with 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. They forbid people to marry. So here the author of 1 Timothy is warning against those who forbid marriage, judging others. What does Jesus teach? In Matthew 7, 1 through 2, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. But in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, Paul specifically instructs the Corinthians to judge those inside the church. He says this, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church, and you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. So this is what I was referencing earlier, and we'll get into some problematic passages. Paul is harsh here. In group, out group. Get rid of them. Paul says, Hey, sexual and moral people, get them out. Judge them and leave them in the dust. And again, Jesus is saying, don't judge. It's just crazy to me. Resurrection appearance. We'll just move on. Obviously, the Gospels couldn't even agree on <laughs> resurrection appearances, who Jesus appeared to and when and how many I'm and the total shit. number. And then Paul just makes up his own list. And again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, the Gospel according to Paul mentions the appearance of Jesus to Peter, the 12, the other 500 brethren, James, all of the apostles, and lastly, himself. Now, just because the other gospel writers left out the 500 would not immediately mean that it didn't happen. But just like Matthew's raising of all the Jewish dead that come to life and walk around the city, when you have an event that is so amazing, if you're a gospel writer trying to record the history of this thing, you would think you'd include it. And so it does cast a huge shadow of doubt on that event in Matthew happening if other authors I don't mention it, or the fact that there were 500 witnesses 
if none of the gospel writers are going to mention that. And even if all of them mentioned 500 witnesses, it still wouldn't prove anything other than that there was a claim that 500 people witnessed this resurrection. We don't have any evidence from any of those people. I can tell you right now, there's 500 people outside my house. And all you have to go on is my word. And there's a good chance there's not 500 people out my house. When you consider that houses aren't typically in places where you can look out your window and see 500 people. Could be. How much more crazy for a one-off claim by one person to say 500 people saw this man raised from the dead? You need more than that. We should not just give this one to Paul. And furthermore, again, it contradicts the Gospels. You know, Paul, for everything he says and how intellectual he comes across and how logical he tries to be, he really doesn't like knowledge or wisdom. You know, he has things like 1 Corinthians 1.20, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Or in 1 Corinthians 8.1, we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up this negative connotation. And he contrasts this with where love builds up. But all throughout the Old Testament, we hear about the importance, specifically in Proverbs, of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that fools despise wisdom. And it kind of seems like Paul despises wisdom and has replaced it with love. I think that's interesting. And I've read it a couple times now, and I wonder if it caught your ear weird, but in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 2, and so it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. This is a very different Paul than we get like in the accounts of Acts, which uh, this again just tells us why we have very little reason to believe Acts. But in Acts 17, 22 through 34, and, and just summarizing here, you know, Paul is utilizing the culture of the day and talking about all this poetry and philosophy from the culture as he preaches about Jesus. So again, an issue. Next would be even just considering what Paul does say about marriage here in 1 Corinthians 7, 28. He says, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Again, talking about how it's better not to marry, but the wisest man who ever lived. And no one would ever be wiser, is what the Bible tells us about Solomon, says this in Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Did he just not read these parts? We know he quotes the Old Testament. Did he not have access to a book of Proverbs? Did he think he was wiser than Solomon? Did he not read that no one can be wiser than Solomon? Was this an issue just to Paul and he's projecting? How did he reconcile this and all the other differences? Again, when he directly contradicted, did he foolish? Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Or in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up this negative connotation. And he contrasts this with where love builds up. But all throughout the Old Testament, we hear about the importance, specifically in Proverbs, of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that fools despise wisdom. And it kind of seems like Paul despises wisdom and has replaced it with love. I think that's interesting. And I've read it a couple times now, and I wonder if it caught your ear weird, but in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 2, and so it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. This is a very different Paul than we get like in the accounts of Acts, which uh, this again just tells us why we have very little reason to believe Acts. But in Acts 17, 22 through no. 34, and, and just summarizing here, you know, Paul is utilizing <laughs> the culture talking about all this poetry and philosophy from the culture as he preaches about Jesus. So again, an issue. Next would be even just considering what Paul does say about marriage here in 1 Corinthians 7, 28. He says, but those who Can marry will face up. many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Again, talking about how it's better not to marry, but the wisest man who ever lived, and no one would ever be wiser, is what the Bible tells us about Solomon, says this in Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Did he just not read these parts? We know he quotes the Old Testament. Did he not have access to a book of Proverbs? Did he think he was wiser than Solomon? Did he not read that no one can be wiser than Solomon? Was this an issue just to Paul and he's projecting? How did he reconcile this and all the other differences? Again, when he directly contradicts even the teachings of Jesus, like on baptism, I just, 
Oof, it's very strange to me, and I think it's something worth thinking about. And again, when Christians get so much ammo and doctrine and identity from Paul's epistles, maybe not even realizing it, it's just something they know is in the New Testament. All I gotta do is get rid of these. How are they poems. reconciling this? Now, this could be a change as Paul progresses in ministry, but there's a big, I think, contradiction in if one should be able to make a living off of ministry. In 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Paul says, In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. This is what the Lord commands. But in Acts 20, 34 through 35, Paul says, You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that, that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. So there we know that Paul, I think Paul was a tent maker, if I'm not confusing it. You know, he makes his own living on the side to support his ministry. But it's commanded by the Lord that those who do preach the gospel should make their living off of doing so. This verse is also bent and used by most prosperity teachers about why they have a right to you their private these jets fucking and their homes. expensive cars and their $2,000 sweaters and things like this. Another thing I want to point out, sorry, I it's the head covering thing in 1 Corinthians has so much we can talk about. You know, in 1 Corinthians 11, 10, it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. You know, God, and I reference, you can make a pretty strong case, I think, back to the angels looking down on the women of men and lusting after them. But this is beside the point. Listen to Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew God nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male versus female. Now I'm going to make a point that is totally not about this book, but bear with me. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is clear about the differences between God men and women, it. whether it is speaking in church, whether it is head coverings, whether God it is in marriage and what they owe one another. This is clear. Paul knows there's a difference God between men and women. So what does he mean in Galatians when he says there is no male or female in salvation. So where's the contradiction here? I'm just using this to show that every single time you bring up slavery with a Christian, they say, ah, uh -uh, what about the New Testament where Paul says there is neither slave nor free men? Just as clearly as there are males and God females, there are free men and slaves. To say that that verse is in Jesus any way God condemning Christ. the act of slavery is as stupid as saying that that verse in any way is Jesus saying that in the view of Christ. Paul, he's wrong that there's a difference between men and women. Hopefully Jesus. you understand my point there. Christ. I hate that excuse for slavery. The Lord's Supper is interesting. Jesus. We get in 1 Corinthians Fuck 11, Christ. 23 through 26, do this in remembrance of me. And many denominations hold on to a verse like this, that it is a symbolic gesture. It is a reference back to the importance of Jesus's sacrifice. And yet we know there are many denominations who take it more seriously, the transubstantiation, and they believe more along the lines of John 6, 53 through 56, where you are consuming the actual flesh and blood of Jesus. It is not a symbolic gesture. And if you fall into either one of these camps, you think the other camp is ridiculous. But I'm just showing where we're getting these ideas and contradictions from. This next one, oh, I'm nervous to bring it up because I can hear the arguments, but let's try to flesh this out. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, compare this with James 1, 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. What I can hear the Christian saying is, God doesn't tempt anyone, but he will allow temptation up to a certain point. I actually don't think this delta really exists. If God is controlling whatever circumstances are allowing me to be tempted, then he is indeed controlling temptation itself. It's the exact same argument as God doesn't cause evil. He just allows natural things to happen, some of which are evil because of the fall that he allowed with his foreknowledge, right? Like you get into the minutia of that, but I don't think it's minutia. I think it's incredible incredibly important, and in the same way that the buck of God, evil stops with God, if he's controlling the levels of temptation, he's allowing temptation in the first place. And we, we see this, right? Satan, God, the accuser, had to come before it. the Lord with his plans for what he was going to do to Job, and only with God's allowance could he go and try to tempt Job away via suffering. It's an unnecessary distinction to say Satan did it. No, 
He could only do it with God's allowance, and therefore God did it. Transitive properties, people. But anyways, let's move on to our final part, problematic God passages. Damn it. Now the good news is, I think I've covered a lot of problematic passages as we've gone through, so hopefully this doesn't have to be too extensive. God but just so we're thorough, that's 1 Corinthians 11, 5 through 6 mainly. Same thing with women being permitted not to speak in church. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, this is where Paul is calling out the sexual immorality of incest that was gossiped about in the church where the man slept with his father's wife. And after addressing it, he says this, For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus, the same Jesus who said not to pass judgment, on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. What does this mean? Uh, see, and whatever it means, future, it's incredibly uh, see, extreme. Dick. Not only is he actually judging, which he should not Suck be doing, dick, but bitch. whatever this means to hand this man over to Satan. And there's many different theological God ideas about it. what this means, and I don't think any of them are good. Also, what is the church's God role here? Are it. they the police? Are they judge and jury? Is this a crime? Are they to carry out some sort of sentencing for it? This is scary stuff. Let's move on next to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Or do you not know that the wrongdoers will not inherit God the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, God nor bucket. adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, Jeez. nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we can talk about Paul's takes on homosexuality. Jesus in fact, it's how Romans starts. There's quite a bit there in Romans 1. But this shouldn't be surprising. Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Leviticus says it's an abomination. Jesus. So Fucking it's not Christ. so much about that to me that I'm making this verse about. Listen to all the things included in here, which of course you have to throw that one in specifically. Jesus. Thieves, greedy, drunkards slanders. It always amazes me how many people, I guess I am making about the homosexual thing a little bit, because how many Christians who are so opposed to homosexuality utilize this verse to show, oh, hey, it's not just an Old Testament thing. Hey, it's New Testament too. It's horrible. On the same level of gossip and drinking too much, which most of those people have gossiped about their homosexual neighbors and are thus equally cast out of inheriting the kingdom of God according to this verse. So I think it's the inconsistency there that bugs me so much. One, what does this mean they won't inherit the kingdom of God? Are these particular sins not forgivable, not redeemable? Or is it people that live in these continuing sins because they're lifestyle sins? Is he just saying before receiving the grace of Christ? It's not even my misunderstanding here. It's the inconsistent application of Christians within this verse that is the problem to me. How about 1 Corinthians 7, 21? Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. If you guys have watched this channel, you know I think the biggest case we can make is that the Bible 100% condones and endorses slavery. One of the biggest cases. Old and New Testament. And just as I showed earlier that in Galatians, it's not a get out of jail free card because there's no slave or free person. It does not actually mean there's no slavery. Here in this verse, God, remain in the it. situation where you were. Hey, if you're a slave and you find Christ, God, you're included in salvation. It. You're still a slave. If you can gain your freedom, do so, but no admonishment that slavery is wrong. And I want you to think about everything Paul is willing to say is wrong, how harshly he judges what he thinks is wrong. If there was anything in Paul's mind which is supposedly directly connected to the revelation of Christ Jesus, this is where we would have heard about it, and we did not. This is not as simple as an omission. By the fact of the omission, in light of all of the prescription, we can see that Paul, and thus Jesus, God, have no issue with slavery. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 through 9. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Why shouldn't we just be called to control ourselves? He's saying homosexuality is 
unforgivable. He doesn't say, oh, but if your homosexual tendencies are so strong, like here's a good outlet. So why make this little exception for lust, which is a sub part of the entire issue? The obvious issue here is, again, the harm that it leads to, which I already talked about. I want to utilize the next verse once again to point out the contradiction and impossibility of reconciling the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New. 1 Corinthians 7, 18 through 19. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Yes, that was a thing. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. So what do you do with the fact that it was God's command for those who followed him to be circumcised? From the very prescription of things it. with Abraham, that every man and God slave in his it. house be circumcised. Now we've pointed this out before with the dietary laws and everything else. Paul's just saying it doesn't matter anymore. He's just made this a thing. Jesus never said this. Jesus said, do not think I've not come to uphold the law and the prophets. Every dot and tittle. Okay, the next one here is a doozy. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2. If any of you have a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? This to me says, Christians, listen, in-group stuff, when you guys mess up, when you have a problem with each other, you don't let the rest of the world know. Sweep it under the rug. Don't seek secular objective legal recourse. How many Christians have been harmed by this kind of thinking? How many sexual abusers have been covered up for by the church so as not to cause doubt or God. division? And also from this place Suck of insane dick, arrogance, bitch. Christians are the ones to judge the world. Again, not what Jesus says. So therefore, they have the obvious right and power to judge the trivial cases amongst one another. No, they are no better at making decisions. If anything, the bias and bigotry within make them less capable. The fear of being found out from the objective public on the fact that they aren't a new creation, that they aren't doing things better through some power of the Holy Spirit than anyone else. They divorce at the same rate, they rape at the same rate, they beat their children at the same rate. It's absolutely insane to me that we have no proof of being a new creation creation in Christ, or what the power of the Holy Spirit allows someone to actually act differently in their life. And yet verses like this suggest that they are better, and they should handle conflict. God fucking damn it. Jesus fucking Christ. Thinking. How many sexual abusers have been covered up for by the church so as not to cause doubt or division? And also from this place of insane arrogance, Christians are the ones to judge the world, again, not what Jesus says, so therefore they have the obvious right and power to judge the trivial cases amongst one another. No, they are no better at making decisions. If anything, the bias and bigotry within make them less capable. The fear of being found out from the objective public on the fact that they aren't a new creation, that they aren't doing things better through some power of the Holy Spirit than anyone else. They divorce at the same rate, they rape at the same rate, they beat their children at the same rate. It's absolutely insane to me that we have no proof of being being a new creation in Christ, or what the power of the Holy Spirit allows someone to actually act differently in their life. And yet verses like this suggest that they are better, and they should handle conflicts internally. It is a prescription for abuse. This I know to be true. Listen to this. Come on with that. First Corinthians 20, 29 through 30. For those, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Now, I believe fallen asleep there to mean to die. So this passage is suggesting that improper participation of the Lord's Supper can actually lead to physical sickness and death. Tell me Paul isn't still operating in this weird world of sin leading to death and sickness, that this is the root cause of Oh, someone got sick when they did the Last Supper in remembrance of Jesus. They didn't have the right heart about it. I remember being warned about this kind of thing in church. Hey, if you're going to participate in communion, okay, you need to get right. You need to have repented and asked for forgiveness of sins, or otherwise don't do this. It's coming from verses like this. Still today, we believe this insanity is a curse.
for not being in the right headspace when participating in these rituals. Think about how ridiculous this sounds. Have you heard of any other religion where you go and you perform a pseudo-cannibalism on your dead savior that's not really dead anyways, where you eat his flesh and drink his blood either realistically or metaphorically, and that if you're not thinking the right thoughts as you do it, you can get sick and die. And yet, that's what Christians have to believe if they accept these New Testament scriptures. The insanity, not just of this religion, but the arrogance and insanity to call all other religions so stupid or pagan or weird or off or whatever the judgment is while not recognizing that this is their reality it really is just ridiculous to me first corinthians 7 3 through 4 the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband the wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband in the same way the husband does not have authority over his body but yields it to his wife oh look Brandon, it's equal he's saying the same thing to the the husband. Yeah, yeah, except there's, there's not many cases, and, and there are some, and this verse would be equally ridiculous in that case. But generally speaking, it is women who suffer because of this. If you're the kind of Christian that thinks marital rape can't happen because of this verse, you are the exact proof of how corrupt this line of thinking is. And I think we'll just stop there. We've covered a lot. I was a little more slower and specific with the contradictions and problematic passages than just throwing them up on the screen. So let me know if you preferred that. Thank you for being here. See, again, I think we covered a ton of ground that we simply did not get in Romans, and I hope that you are seeing the educational purposes of, of each book. That's my goal. I don't ever just want it to be another one for another episode. And I think there's enough that we can pull out of most of these. We'll see when we get to, like, Third John. Who knows how that's going to go? But we've got some room to grow still. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I'll see you Sunday with a new video. And until then... Jesus. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support. My iconoclast, Ian, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Ron, and Sean. My humanist heroes, Jared, James, and Christine. My atheist advocates, Caleb, Imposter, Jeff, Jeffrey, Karen, Paul, Sparky, and Sean, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel, or you just enjoyed the content, please consider joining these fine people today. Home!